All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah. In the name of Allah, we start. In the sixth century, in the Arabian Peninsula, in the city of Medina, there was a man of religiosity who believed in a creator, believed in prophets, but he was a super duper minority. Everyone around him in Medina and much of Arabia, they worshiped idols, rocks. So one day he leaves his house, this man, and he tells a tribe called Bani Abdul Ashhal, a tribe, Arabian tribe. He tells them, you know what guys? There will be life after death. There will be resurrection. There will be judgment. If you do good, you'll be rewarded with paradise. If you do bad, you'll be punished with the hellfire. The people were like, oh, come on, man. You really believe we will come back to life after we were buried? You seriously believe in that nonsense? He said, I surely believe in it. And I would rather, I would rather be placed in the hottest oven in the world, but not be punished in the hellfire. Oh, Okay, okay, so you really believe there's reward and punishment. Okay, mister, what is your greatest proof that you can provide to us for the tallest claim that you're making that there's resurrection? What is your greatest proof? So this man stands, he looks at them. He said, my greatest proof will come from a man. And this man will come from this area. And he pointed down south. He pointed down south. It can mean Mecca, it can mean Yemen, but he pointed down south. So one of the people said, okay, mister, so this man, whoever he is, whenever he comes out, he better be bringing some breaking, amazing, wonderful, impeccable proofs of that. You guys agree? So they asked, and when is this mister coming? When will he show up? So this man of religiosity, he looked at the whole Arab tribe from Bani Abdul Ashhal. And he looked at them, then he saw the youngest child. And he said, I believe that this child, when he grows older, he will witness the man coming. So that's very, very soon. Brothers and sisters, the Arabian Peninsula, this man was pointing towards, was full of Arab. But who are the Arab? As I speak about the Arab brothers and sisters, in general, I will go deeper into talking about a tribe from the Arab. Then number three, I will talk about one couple from the tribe of the Arab. So I'll go in order. So I will zoom out, then zoom in and zoom further in. So the Arab in general, I will share with you six very significant traits they were famous of, ready? Number one, they used to be obsessed with worshiping idols. What in the world do you mean idols? Idols made of rocks. Seriously? Yes. Made of rocks and they believe these idols, this is plastic, but just an example. They believe that this rock that they worship brings benefit and protects them from harm. And on what basis do you believe in that? For two reasons, ready? Number one, and I want you to, as I'm speaking about the six traits I have prepared for you, the six things here, I want you to relate if we have anything today similar to that. Fair enough? They believe because mom and dad used to do it. Mom and dad did it, so I do it. It doesn't make sense. I don't know, mom and dad did it. And you know our culture, if I try to be in this tough guy who thinks outside the box, I will be end up in the box. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna stick with mom and dad said, all right? And you know, the Arab were obsessed about status, even if it doesn't make sense on what basis it may be. Okay, why did your parents do that? What's going on? The other reason to share with you, there are more, but the other one to share with you, shufa'auna indallah. They believed these idols were the middle person between them and the creator. So they do not go directly to the creator of the heavens and the earth. They go to the middle man or the middle idol or the rock. They say, can you please talk to the creator? You know, I'm sick, you know, tell him to cure me. Please do me a favor. And then, oh, you know what? I'm struggling. I'm not having children. Can you do something about this? Or I don't have an income. Please help me. That's how they believed. And they were obsessed about it. And what's crazy is that when they saw another rock, huh? 
Another rock that is bigger, nicer, maybe even colorful, they dump it and they go to another trend, whatever is trending, right? And I will follow that and they worship that. It was unbelievable. Brothers and sisters, are we any similar to that today? How is that? I'm just going to ask questions. I'm not going to necessarily assume things or explicitly say things, but just something to think of. First of all, what does it mean with worship? I'm going to make the term simple, okay? What is it to know what you worship to an extent? You want to know what you worship to an extent? You want to? Honestly. What is it that you are willing to sacrifice everything in the world for? Everything. I asked myself that question. So I said, I would live for my children. I would take a bullet for my children. When my children are around, I'm happy. When they're away, I'm sad. Would I give up everything? Yeah, yeah. But then I realized maybe from my end, according to my beliefs, if it comes down to pleasing the creator or pleasing the creation at opp opposites, I will choose the creator over my children. So. If I was truthful, then who do I worship? The Creator. Some people do you not agree with me. They worship money. Agreed, literally. What do you mean? They will be willing to give up their own families for income, yes or no? Your mom is suffering. You're the only one who can help her out, but you chose another location for 2,000 extra dollars or whatever your situation may be, but I'm being a bit generic here. Are you guys with me? Willing to give up your spouse and your children just for a little bit of more money. Are there not people like that and for reasons that are not justifiable? I'm watching my words here. Are there not people that say ball is life? Right? Maybe it's an exaggeration, but some of them are like, I will give up everything in the world for basketball. I saw people say music is my soul. Yes or no? I even saw a brother one time. He, was, he is the most attached person I've seen in my life to music. I don't say he worship it. But it was extreme. He had a total car accident, total the car. So he called me and we went and I actually went to the accident scene. And they said, brother, are you okay? He was sitting on the curb, sad. I'm like, everything is fine. He said, can you believe it, Majid? Can you believe it? This was the first time in my life I drive without music. So he attributed the harm that he went through due to the lack of music. So whatever the case may be, being generic, but the most important part of this, what is it? Be honest, 100%. The last one you want to lie to is yourself. Last time, what is it that you would be willing to sacrifice everything in the world for? That what will tell you what you worship. May Allah allow us to be wise with our decisions. The other thing the Arab used to do, famous for eating decaying flesh. What? Yes, meat that is like decayed, disgusting, and so on and so forth. If it's what's available, if I'm hungry, if I desire it, I'm eating this thing, right? That's how they behave. They didn't care much about their health and so on. How about today? Can we relate to that? Can we? How? What about junk food? Bro, come on, junk food, decayed flesh, like relax. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right, all right. Even though, by the way, junk food, which is full of fat, sugar, very minimal n n uh, nutritional facts and minerals, I studied very well, alhamdulillah. All right, okay, and I'm guilty of that. Do you know that in the US, one out of three adults every single day consume fast food? More than one over three, which is 36%, the number was given by the National Center of Health Statistics. Forget junk food, controversial, I'm guilty of it. So what do I go for? What else do we consume that is filthy? It's in a way non-negotiable. What about cigarettes? Right or wrong? Right? Nothing against smokers, but I have something against cigarettes. You see the difference, right? Okay, love you guys. May Allah protect you. And if you're here, may Allah protect you and keep you steadfast. Not on smoking, but steadfast upon leaving that which is wrong, okay? Really, do you know that tobacco, and I got you here, from the World Health Organization, they stated that tobacco is the epidemic, the biggest public health threat the world has ever faced, smoking, with its levels, and you name it, the, the type of smoking that is out there. How many smokers in the world? What's your guess? Take, give me a number. How many smokers in the world? Take a shot. 
10 million. There's 1.1 billion smokers in the world, according to the World Health Organization. How many, according to statistics, tend to die from the 1.1 billion? 50% will die due to tobacco relationship. You know what's really interesting? You might be sitting like, Alhamdulillah, I don't smoke. Listen up, Alhamdulillah person. May Allah protect you, say Ameen. May Allah make you always say Alhamdulillah, say Ameen. Alhamdulillah means, oh, thank you, oh, praise Allah. 15% of those who die from tobacco, they die because of secondhand smoke. Because Ammu, Khalto, Argila next to you, right? Auntie or uncle with the hookah or the cigarettes, and like, I don't smoke, but because whew, that smoke travels, we learned that correct air travels and so on and so forth, 15% of them die. Is that not some of the stuff that perhaps we consume that might be dangerous for us? Relate to what we're talking about. May Allah protect you all. Say Ameen. What about alcohol consumption? Alcohol consumption. Do you know that once again, according to the World Health Organization, 5.9% of global death is related to alcohol? 5.9%. May Allah protect us. You go ask a high school student. Go ask. So is it common that uh, students, they smoke and uh, they do this and that and some drugs and stuff? I don't think they will tell you yes or no. I don't think so. You know what they will say? <laughs> Where do you live? What kind of question is that? Do, it's all over. That's, as in that true brothers and sisters, right? You ask one of the, I asked one of the brothers, several of them had the same reaction. That's why I have it in my notes. They're like, <laughs> you give lectures? <laughs> You have to know your crowd, your target audience, all right? I'm like, okay, I'm just, that's why exactly what I'm asking you. May Allah protect us and our children, say Ameen. So all these things happening, what else? The Arabs were very known for committing impure acts. And you know what's interesting? What do we learn? You are, you are what you eat to an extent. So since they ate decaying flesh and ate things that sort of to be of filth, as a result, they're Outward behavior due to the inward consumption also became filth. It was very, very bad, brothers and sisters. Of the bad actions that they used to do, many of the Arab, I'm not saying all, but many of them, they had no respect to women. Zero. How was that? A man would marry an unlimited number of women. She has no say over it. It gets worse. He can even combine between two biological sisters. It gets worse and further grows. It goes and he, this man, can divorce and bring back and divorce and bring back as many times as he wants. And she cannot open her mouth. It gets worse. When this man finally dies, none of the ladies he got married to inherit anything he left behind. He left behind two houses, None of the ladies, they take anything. It gets worse. How is that even possible? If this man left behind two children, two boys, the boys, one of them will take the house and the other will take what? The second house, correct? Not just that, they will inherit whomever their dad got married to. So the women do not, not just receive inheritance, they are part of the package of inheritance. You see how horrible that is? From the men's side, now go to the women's side. It gets really, really bad. I'm gonna watch my language because we have some few youngsters in the crowd, but may Allah protect us and guide us with the choice of words, say I mean. Some of the ladies, whatever the cause may be, whoever started the chicken or the egg, will leave it back to the creator, all right? Let's proceed. Some of the ladies would have an open door policy. And I want the adults to catch what I'm referring to. Are you guys with me? They will actually have flags on their doors, signs indicating that I'm available for whoever, whoever is able to afford it. So they would to come and then eventually the lady becomes pregnant. And this is based on authentic narration. She will become pregnant, then she hires. Who does she hire? She hires a face recognizer. Why? Because when this lady delivers the child, the face recognizer will come and that's the customs. All the men that ever walked into her house will line up. And the face recognizer will look at the child, look at the men. 
Look at the child, look at the men, and then decide, you know what? This child looks like the most, like this man over there. And this man has no say, except to father that child. You see that level? Can we compare to that today? I'm headed to our country in a few days. I'm headed to our country in a few days where most of their children are brought outside of marriage. This is the times that we live in. Okay, well, I don't see how big of a deal it is. No problem, no problem, let's proceed. What about the objectification of women, yes or no? Are we, li are we living in the dark ages without us knowing? <laughs> May Allah protect us. What about the objectification of women where according to studies from the Wesleyan University, they found that on average from 58 different magazines, whenever a woman is used in these magazines, 51% are used as objects. And you know what kind of objects I'm referring to, yes or no adults, correct? And it gets worse when the magazines are for men. If it's a specific magazine for men, then that number, seven out of 10 times, you see a woman in a men's magazine, then she was there simply due to being that type of object. This is today. What about the adult, right, industry? The billions of dollars that they're making. What about today when you go to a gentleman's club? So that's who are the gentlemen? So if you don't go to these things, you're not a gentleman. See the words and the choices. You drive and you hurt and you want to cover your five and eight year old, which I had to kind of explain to because they saw the sign and they read the words at seven and eight years old. Why do they say available such and such? May Allah protect us, say I mean. Let's proceed, let's proceed. So the Arab had one, worshiping idols. Number two, eating decaying meat or flesh. Number three, committing impure acts. You see how the family system is? You see that? So it's only common sense. Right from the get-go, the family is broken. Therefore, number four, they had no respect to family relations, which makes sense, right? From a child standpoint, a child, he or she would to grow older and imagine being told, listen, I think that's her dad. How do you think he will feel or she will feel? I was able to be patient towards my father for all these years and now you're telling me there's a chance he is not my father? You know how that child may rebel, yes or no? And that's who you are all these years? And even the parents themselves, they are so nervous about the child, and probably it's not, you're not mine, are you guys with me? It's horrible, it's a disaster. Especially, especially if the child was a girl, why? Because the father is so nervous. It seems that as a father, I have two options. That's what some of them says. My first option as a father who's living there, either they believe that my daughter will end up being one of the wives of the oppressing man. Remember that? One of the wives of the oppressing man. Or the other side of things, she can end up one of them girls who has that sign. You see that? So extreme on both ends. So what do they do? When they see their wives pregnant and about to deliver, they go to their idols. Where's the idol? They go to their idol and they pray. What do they pray for? Make it a boy, make it a boy, make it a boy, make it a boy. And if she delivers a girl, what happens? Yatawara min al qawm. Oh, what an embarrassment. What should I tell the people? A girl. So he asks himself, should I just bury my emotions? Or should I bury her? Is, they, are they, is that an exaggeration or they're serious? May Allah protect us. Say Amin. And this happens. Narration after narration, how a man, a father, because of obsession of status and ego, I don't allow any of my girls to end up having, even if it's 1% chance for her to end up being like that group or that group. He would to dig a grave right next to his wife who was going through death of the delivery of a child. He awaits, he awaits, it's a girl while she's crying. They cut the umbilical cord and he throws it right then and there into that grave and he dumps the soil at her. It can get worse at times when people with the ego status, they wait till the child gets older. 
five, six years old to show the Arab, you know who you're talking to? Five, six year old, a husband will tell his wife, shower the girl, dress her up. She feels it. This is the practice of our people, please. He says, don't worry about it. Do what I'm telling you to do. Showers the girl, dresses her up and everything. Five, six year old, like a first grader or so, goes and daddy, I, are you, are you going to do this? He says, none of your business. And he brings her and he brings her. And he has the grave already. What is this? Daddy, I beg you. Back and forth. And he has said, go with the eagle. He grabs the girl. She's crying. She's devastated. And he's <laughs> so he puts her in the grave and she's yelling and crying. And he forces her with his power. And he dumps the soil at her and she's dead. That's the type of people. Can we relate to that today? Can we relate to killing of babies today? Without getting into very much depth. Right? When people would throw a bomb at a city and they don't care who, to whom it falls. Yes or no? Are there not today fathers and mothers who are embarrassed when they have daughters? Yes or no? Be honest. I swear by Allah, which is very sad, but I assume well of the people. Alhamdulillah, I'm blessed with four girls. When I got my third girl, a man came to me and he says, huh, what did you get? I said, my third girl. He came and he tapped my shoulder. He said, it's okay, brother. And he's serious. He said, next time, next time you'll get a boy. Next time, it's okay. He was giving me his condolences. This is in the 21st century, people. Are we similar? Let's proceed. What about disrespecting of neighbors? The Arab were all about disrespecting neighbors. They didn't care. You cross into my property, you're dead. You're done. It's over. It happened. It happened. They had no, they had no respect to neighborhoods or neighbors. A true story. A man in his property, he sees a camel crossing into his property from his neighbor. He doesn't send the camel back, doesn't reach out to the owner. You come here with the arrow, shot it, killed, dead. The camel is like a Mercedes today, people. So he comes and he kills the camel. Why the respect to your neighbors? Then the other neighbors, when they saw that and they heard that their camel got killed, you killed my camel? You dare to touch my camel? What did they do? Not go fix the problem, take a camel from his or two equivalent or try to resolve it in that way. You know what they did? They killed the guy. They killed him. And when this man who killed the camel got killed, his whole family, whole family and tribe waged war against the other tribe. So you're telling me they had bloodshed? They killed one another? Yes. For how many days? Oh, for over 30 years. If you know Harb al-Basus and things of that sort from history, over 30 years because of one camel. Generations were dead because how dare you cross my property line? Can we relate to this today? Maybe today, we will destroy you and your whole country, not because you cross, because I think you will cross. <laughs> yes or no? You might cross. I think you have the utilities to destroy me. So instead of waiting for you, I'm just gonna go and destroy you all. And guess what? Once they arrive, these people had nothing. Yes or no? Neighboring countries or families or whatever the case may be. Go at a lower scale. You and I, how are people with their exhaust system? They're mufflers, right? Bro, I spent a thousand dollars over this thing. So, at 11 p.m. waking up the whole neighborhood. I don't care. Where's the respect to your neighbors? Even if you're playing your religious tape, whatever religion you come from, blasting the Quran or the Bible, spiritually connected to the Creator, what connection it is to the Creator when it's at the expense for no justification of cutting your connection to the creation. Are you guys with me? Just reflect, reflect, we try, are we able to relate? Last but not least, oppression prevailed. If you're strong, if you're powerful, if you are from the elite, and you make the biggest mistake in the world, no one will talk to you. They will say, oh, I can't see without glasses. 
right? Because the elite, the rich. But if the weak and the poor made the smallest mistake, like a capital punishment, it's over. Can we relate to that of oppression? You know how much oppression was at their time? They had a line of poetry. The line said, Man la nas yudlam. What does it mean? He who does not oppress the people will be oppressed. So what is that supposed to mean? Before I wait and get oppressed, I'm gonna be proactive and start oppressing people. That's how they believed and that's how they lived. May Allah protect us, say Ameen. So all these things, yes, not everyone was like that, but it was significant enough for this to be the highlights of how the Arab used to live. May Allah protect us. This is the Arab in, in general. After speaking about the Arab in general, I wanna zoom in to where? To a specific tribe from the Arab. They are called the tribe of Quraysh, tribe of Quraysh. Afterwards, I'll talk about a couple, married couple afterwards. The tribe of Quraysh out of all the Arabian Peninsula, they lived in Mecca, all right? They lived where? In Mecca, wonderful. These people in Mecca were known to live in a sacred land. You have to give me your undivided attention. This is very important. Why was their land sacred? Uh, brother, before you jump the gun and stuff, what does sacred mean? Ah, okay. Sacred land meaning no fighting shall take place in Mecca. Wow. No killing, amazing. So out of the whole Arabian Peninsula and the oppression and the killing of little girls and all that stuff, what makes Mecca special? Many reasons from the main ones is the fact that there is a Kaaba. Okay, take it easy on me, Kaaba, what's Kaaba? Kaaba is a house, like a cube shape in which people believe for it to be the house of the creator, okay? And the Arab believed that this is the house of the Creator. So that's why they had the city to be safe. As a result of Mecca being safe, what do you expect to happen? Number one, spiritually and religiously. Mecca becomes the national capital of religion. Yes or no? Why? They used to worship idols, correct? So this means if I go to Mecca, I put my idol here, and the Kaaba is right there, the house of the Creator is there, that's the strongest Wi-Fi connection. So I will go all the way to Mecca and ask whatever, hey listen, okay please hook it up, he's right there, all right? Just go talk, you know the house is right there. Very backwards, very backwards. So that becomes the religious capital of the nation. Moving forward, what else happens economically? How is Mecca gonna boost economically? Remember, no killing, no theft, no stealing. So businessmen and women would love to buy and sell in Mecca. So Mecca becomes not a national trade city, becomes an international trade city, yes or no? What else socially? Socially, the people of Mecca that are taking care of the Kaaba, they're known as what? Quraysh, remember what they're known as what? Quraysh. So the Quraysh socially, they are the most of respected of people in all of Arabia. Are you guys with me? Why? They are the caretakers of the Kaaba. So they would go travel up north. Highway robberies, they come, hey, give us your stuff. Listen, this is my idea, I'm from Mecca. Oh, my bad, my bad, sir, here we go. First class treatment, you're from Quraysh? Respect, brother, respect, right? How are you taking care of my idol in Mecca? You're washing it up for me, right? I saw some bird stuff on it. Yeah, yeah, I took care of your God, don't worry, right? That's how things were. So can you imagine someone coming and telling them, these idols don't really benefit you? Can you imagine someone telling them that you guys are equal, black, white, Arab, non-Arab, Quraysh, non-Quraysh. Can you imagine you're shaking someone's status like that? Can you imagine, as I said about the Arab in general, coming and try to fix things, what they will do to you? You wanna stop oppression? You wanna stop the objectification of women? You want to bring the families together? You know what people will do to you? The ones who are up there, and you know what I'm referring to you, right? May Allah protect us, say Ameen. So that's how the people of Quraysh were. 
Now I want to go zoom in as a last circle. You're like, wait, wait, brother, brother. Yes. Why don't some people just move to the Roman Empire? Just go to Europe. Okay, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about Europe, okay? But you look in the books. As they are leaving the 6th century and entering into the next century, many of the historians, what do they say about Europe? They, are, they went through the dark ages. So they're not that great as well at that time, okay? So the world as a whole, some classify it as the worst moment in human history. كُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ you guys were at the verge of like, it just doesn't get any worse. That's how some people viewed it. Next, in the sixth century, we spoke about the Arab, the tribe from Quraysh, then one couple. Who are they? Abdullah and Amina. Here you go, a little bit of hearts for you to kind of tone down the, because it got a little bit intense, I feel you. You know, I, inshallah, the team hooked it up with the hearts. Abdullah and Amina, now check this out, all right? Abdullah, Abdullah is from Quraysh, from Mecca. Amina is from Medina, okay? Abdullah and Amina, wonderful couple, beautiful. What's so special about them is that they had a proper, pure marriage. May Allah grant that to every one of us. Proper, pure marriage. Never did Abdullah, never, and I wanna stress on it so many times, never did Amina ever indulge with a man outside of marriage. And that was very prestigious, by the way. People in Mecca respected this couple, like loyalty, right? And what's even more amazing that Abdullah's parents and Amina's parents were the same way. Oof. More interesting, Abdullah's grandpa, Amina's grandpa and grandma, all of them were also from pure, proper marriages. They're like, what a lineage to be proud of in the midst of the chaos happening, correct? One day, Amina announces to her husband, guess what? I'm pregnant, right? Amina is pregnant. And with her pregnancy, brothers and sisters, she sleeps one night and she sees a dream. Amina sleeping, sees the dream. The dream, light, light came from her body that lighted all of up north to Medina. No, no, go further. How far? All the way to where the Roman Empire, to Asham. That's the dream that she had. Light came from her body. She woke up the next morning. How do you think she felt? Optimistic, right? There's a lot of darkness around. And she said, I'm gonna take from my dream that my son or my daughter, whoever it is, will shed some light in the midst of that darkness. Can we take that lesson from Amina? Can we be optimistic with our dreams? Inshallah. Some people are so creative with being pessimistic. Amazing. Like, wow, that was so creative. Like how you thought outside the box. They tell you, yes, according to what you just said, brother, the light comes from the body, right? Yes, and the light is so strong. Yes or no? Yes. And you said it goes so far up north. Yes, yes. I see that as a horrible sign. Why you say that? Because this means the light is so strong, it will make the people blind. Oh my God. Why you're like that? Why? Don't be that type of people, right? You go turn around and make something negative or something completely positive. May Allah make us optimistic. Say what I mean. Mecca is under attack. Mecca is under attack. Mecca is under attack. Mecca under attack. The sacred land of Mecca. Yes, what's going on? People are coming, people are coming to do what? To destroy the Kaaba. Mecca where no two people can fight. An army is coming by itself to destroy the Kaaba. Who is that? What's going on? It's someone from the south. He's traveling up north. What's his story? With him are elephants. They've never seen that before. Elephants with the guy coming up north. Why? This man, in summary, in two words, it was all about jealousy and envy. He was so jealous. People in Mecca, they have the Kaaba, they have all the tourist attraction. What's so special about this whole cube that they have? Everybody goes to Mecca. Mecca is sacred, Mecca is safe. Look at me down south. Theft, no tourism, no economy, no respect. So he tried to build a temple, spent so much money into that temple. 
Here you guys, free tuition, free inter entrance, free whatever you, I'll do whatever you want, just come. Nobody showed up. So instead of, of this man and his people trying to put their energy to grow, they used that energy to put other people down. So he came and he went all the way to Mecca and he realized the only thing I can do, the only thing I can do is destroy this Kaaba. Are we envious? Are we jealous people? Uh, you need to watch your language. No, really, I'm just asking. <laughs> Are we? Let's see. How can I know? Just like this man. Usually, you are jealous or I am jealous or envious towards close people, not far. Yes or no? Are you like, oh, I'm so envious LeBron James can dunk like that? <laughs> no, you know I cannot be like this guy. Khalas, you move on. You know who you're jealous? When your cousin does this. Your cousin, oh Allah, break your legs, right? <laughs> right? And that's why it's dangerous. Envy is pretty close circle, right? May Allah bless the sister who gave me these points. So when the envy, like, are you so jealous that so-and-so rich billionaire somewhere in the country has a Lamborghini? No. You're so jealous when your neighbor buys a new Honda. <laughs> right? My neighbor? In my neighborhood? And jealousy is so irrational. It makes you irrational. It makes you, like, weird. This guy came from down south. What was he riding on? Horses? With what? Elephants. The maximum speed of a horse is 55 miles per hour. The maximum speed of an elephant, according to Sheikh Google, is 25 miles per hour. So he had the patience to destroy other people with elephants. Like, you know how weird you look like? <laughs> right? You could have destroyed the elves otherwise. I don't know. Let's get more people. But that's how irrational it's like someone. Hey, brother, what's up? Uh, you like the car? Yeah, whatever. You wanna try, you wanna sit in the back, see how comfortable it is? <sighs> sure, okay. Then the guy sits in the back, and the owner of the car, so how do you like it? it it's okay, it, it's okay. Ya Rab, Ya Rab, make this car flip. Make it flip. <laughs> yeah, you're in the car. You're in the car. <laughs> Right? This irrational envy and jealousy makes people do the queerest stuff ever. That energy, you could have used it to grow yourself. So they did and they went to attack Mecca and the people ran to the mountains on Arabia. They ran. And then when they ran, all of a sudden with the elephants, elephants are not moving. <laughs> elephants are not moving. What's going on? All of a sudden, the people of the elephant and the people of Mecca, they see something never seen before. A group of birds are coming in organized form. What is going on? This is witnessed by thousands of people. Group of birds holding stones and rocks. And they're coming towards the army of elephants and they're throwing the rock right at each, each shoulder. And each shoulder is dead right then and there. That target is not being missed. Every rock smash one, two, three, four. All shoulders are dead. All those attacking the Kaaba. And then, the birds go away, the people of Mecca, they leave at that scene of how this Kaaba has been protected. Wow, so many lessons, so many. They learned something, I hope you learn as well. They learned that envy and jealousy is destructive. Yes or no? And they learned another lesson. We need to accept things at times that we had no control over, yes or no? So if your own cousin lives in a big house and was born into a rich family and you're not, you don't hate on your cousin, yes or no? You just grow yourself. So I have to accept things. So if people were given things they had no control over, I have to work my way up and not hate on other people. Third and last lesson, for those of religion, feel free to agree or disagree, okay? They believed that the creator of this house if he, the creator, wants to ever protect someone and the whole world is on the other side trying to ruin that someone, the creator will always win. That's what they resolved. Why? Because none of this victory ever involved any of the people that worshipped what? Idols. So they cannot attribute the success to them and to their idols. Ah, sad news. 50 days before her due date, 50 days. This incident happened, and somewhere around that time, Amina gets some news. What? Abdullah is not doing too well. What happened? Abdullah dies. And how a 
painful moment it is for Amina, just expecting that child and the husband passes away. She's so sad she lost her other half. She's so sad her husband will not witness the growth of their child. She's so sad that her child, boy or girl, will not experience fatherhood. I pray to Allah to bless every single parent family. Say Amin. For every mother out there who had her husband pass away or she happens to be divorced, look to Amina what she will do. May Allah protect us. Learn from each other. May Allah protect us. Very difficult times, brothers and sisters. On a Monday, contractions. It's time. The baby, contractions are coming. It's not as bad as it sounded like from before when I heard from other ladies. Contraction, the people around, the loved ones are excited and wish the best, the health for the mother and the child. And the Amina eventually delivers the baby. And the first thing any mother would like to do when she delivers the baby is to know that the baby is doing okay. And the second thing she wants to do is hug and embrace the baby and breastfeed the baby. And when the baby was delivered, they asked, what shall we name him? What shall we name him? And they said, let's name him Muhammad. Let's name him Muhammad. That's unique. Muhammad? What does that mean? It means praiseworthy. Muhammad means the one who has so many good qualities that is worthy of praise. I'm optimistic. I saw a dream about this boy. What will Amina do? What's the next steps? How will she raise a child in the midst of the chaos around? What will she do? All of that, inshallah. Let's go pray Maghrib. Then we'll come right after, inshallah.